So it is my great pleasure to convene our afternoon panel. We've managed to bring together three top ex leading researchers in the field of dementia management and technology. Dr. Arlena Stell with the Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health, Jen Bozier with Toronto Re Rehabilitation Institute, and Dr. Elaine Wiersma with Lakehead University. Three of them will speak for a few minutes to introduce themselves, their relationship to the topic, and a bit of their work, and then we'll moderate a little bit of question and answer. Uh, we'll have it until 4 p.m. or just maybe a few minutes after that, and then we'll take another quick break, and we'll do some breakout sessions afterwards. Uh, so I won't waste any more, more of your time. It's my pleasure to pass the mic to Arlene. Oh, th thanks, Scott. And um, th hi, everybody. I'm really uh, pleased to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be here this morning. I was at, at another dementia meeting. And uh, I really want, wanted to uh, get here as quick as I could. So what I've got here is, I know it's not th what the rest of the meeting has been like, but if you can turn and look at a screen, what I thought would be helpful, instead of me trying to explain some of the work that I've done on interface, developing interfaces that people with dementia can use, would be up to you to show you them. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do this quickly uh, because I know we don't have much time. And what I would like to say is um, I've brought an array of things from different projects that I've been involved with. Some of them are what I would call bespoke um, apps for people. Um, they were made specifically by working with people with dementia and taking their needs into account. You'll also see a little bit of work using uh, where w that we're looking at with um, apps you can get from the, you know, the app like the iTunes store, and then also a system that was developed for people without cognitive impairment, but you'll see some of the people with dementia using it as well. So the first few slides I'm gonna show you, this is from a system that was developed to support communication between people who have dementia and caregivers. It's called Circa, and you'll see here, basically this is part of it. it, it does three things. It plays music, it plays video clips, and it shows photographs. And so, for instance, here's one of the music players, and then here's another example of a music player. So if it's radio, the first one obviously was records, this is radio. Um, the next one, maybe unfamiliar to most people, it's an old reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. Um, the songs down the side, sorry, if you go back to his, sorry. <laughs> if you just do the back arrow. Um, on the real, on the, um, the reel to reel, the song list down the side, these are all Scottish songs. Uh, this, a lot of this work was done in Scotland and the reel to reel was quite familiar to a lot of the people. And the idea, if you're wondering, well, why would you bother doing that? We found when we played music without anything associated with it, that wasn't as, as enjoyable, when, but when it was associated with like a radio or the, the gramophone or so on. Um, the next one is the interface for TV programs. And again, it's just giving it that sort of context. You'll notice while well, we use primary colors, um, the font size, uh, it, is, it is in white as opposed to black, but we found from the research that that was quite readable. This was being used by people um, Tis, can you move us on? And this is an example from just one of the many care homes that have been using this. Now you'll also see that the touch screen this was done on is quite large. And there's two reasons for that. Some of this work was done quite a few years ago and uh, way before the tablets that we're all familiar with and the smartphones. Um, and so a lot of, uh, the we were able to do a lot of exploration with things about, about size and how much things to put on the screen and so on, which I think are even more important now because with the size of, screens on tablets, for instance, you really, really can't have clutter you and you need things that are clear. So the font size you saw there was based on quite a lot of research into what was um, legible for people. So that's something really important to keep in mind. Um, the next one is from a, a subsequent study into games. And this is a paint painting game. Um, normally I would show videos of how it works, but basically the idea is the pot and the base rotates like in a pottery. Um, you have three p active paint pots at a time. You can touch them, uh, paint, and then you touch the pot, the color appears on the screen. Um, if people stop interacting, either the paint pots jump up and down or you get a, a prompt. And again, this was all based on research as to how you keep people interacting when they're on their own. And actually people respond very well. With This game is very popular. People will sit and play it and a lot of the people we've worked with were not computer users at all. So I'm talking about the sort of the generation that's perhaps very old now. When we were working with them, they're in their 70s and 80s. But the, the basic principles of making something that's simple, obvious, I think is what I'm trying to get across. And the next one, 
This is a bit more complex. This was a 3D environment that we tried out. Um, it was based on a real botanic garden, which we filmed and then pieced together and made some elements to touch. And if you touch things like the fish, where it says see the fish, there's a little short clip with some appropriate mood music and so on. And again, this was very exploratory. It was to see if people could navigate and how they would cope with the things moving around. And then we interviewed people afterwards and said, how did you like it? And people were very keen, especially on this one, although a lot of the men liked the pub version. <laughs> <laughs> would have been quite happy sitting in there. <laughs> um, but I suppose this one, again, it looks more complex, but what we were trying to figure out was how much you know, can you offer to people? And again, so long as things are consistent, like the instructions, and they, the same thing always happens. So if you touch something, it's always guaranteed to do something. Those are really important. Um, this is another one. Now, I don't know if this will work. Um, if you press in the middle of it, if you put the arrow into the, oh, no, it's okay. If you go back, sorry. Um, this one here, um, actually, normally, it makes um, flowers grow. And this was a very quick um, uh, illustration. It's a very simple thing. Just You just touch one thing and something happens. But in the next one, you can see someone is playing a musical game. And there's actually three different ways you can interact with it. There's a red button in the bottom. There's a um, ball in the middle, which will hit the chance. Or you can press the music. And people... Um, different people will respond to that in different ways, but again, everybody can play that. The, f the final couple are this, some of you may know, is a game called Bubble Explode, and we were looking at current apps to see um, what sort of things, features would make them suitable for people with dementia, and our work with our um, uh, patient partnership group, and also now with about 30 people um, with dementia in various stages in daycare and care homes have found uh, the, the larger balls and the middle size are both acceptable. People can play this game with very minimal um, support. And then finally, this is a completely different sort of system. This is on a 15-inch uh, computer. Uh, it's called Nana. And this, as you can see, is, it's about recording what you're eating. Now, this was developed in partnership with about 400 older people um, who mainly didn't have cognitive impairment. Um, and you can see it's very simple. It's all very much visually based. The labels are very minimal. Basically, it's a, a tree structure, so you go behind it. Um, this is actually the, the lowest level in terms of the actual fruit. Um, and this final screen is when we took it to a day center for people with dementia, and you can see everybody was having a go um, and, and were, was able to use it with varying amounts of instruction. But people who had, never, again, never seen it before, didn't even know it existed, they were just passing by, and we said, would you like to come in and try this? And, you know, everybody was able to have a go. So I don't know what sort of thing you're conceptualizing, but I thought I'd show you some of the things that certainly I've tried and found have, you know, people can use um, and with success. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Move along. All right. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Hi. So I'm Jen Boger. I work at U of T in Toronto Rehab. Our lab does artificially intelligent technology to support people's well-being. Can we switch? Thank you. Um, so we do a lot of ambient technologies. No, not the mic. It's me. I know. It's like never mind. <laughs> getting you off. Um, Let me go talk to them. We do a lot, I'll try, I'll just do that. Okay. A lot of ambient technologies. So we're looking, so our lab does technologies that are embedded within the environment. And we do a lot of stuff for aging well and supporting well-being. And dementia is a big population that we look at. It sounds like it.
just dementia, but any sort of tech design. And that's great that now we're all in the same room talking to each other. So what I think you as developers really need to do is to really get into the heads of people with dementia and code from that sort of aspect. So some of the themes that you're seeing come out today and certainly that we found in doing our research is that you cannot expect from these people or the caregivers either who are often old, like older adults, you know, 80s, 90s, and overburdened. You can't expect these people to learn to use your technology. Hey, hey. Hello? Hey. So they, they have to be able to use the technology, pick it up, and just be able to go with it. So Arlene has shown you some examples there, um, you know, of technologies where they're self-explanatory. You look at it, and you know exactly what to do with it. And if there's any sort of interactive, there's something that really points out, hey, you know, it's either labeled, or it flashes at you, or somehow it enables you to understand that you're supposed to do something with this. So you can't really have layers. Layers on technology is very difficult for dementia. Uh, whatever you're doing, it has to be sort of all right there, or if you interact with something, it pulls you to the next layer of what you have to do. But that is built in. You can't expect people to search for it, and you can't expect them to, um, to ask for help for it either, is the other thing. because they might not know that they need help with whatever it is that they're trying to do, right? So uh, unlike a lot of technologies now that assume if you're the user and you can't figure out to do something, you'll Google it, it's not an option in this case. So just keeping that in mind. And I just want to wrap up this thought too with, um, it was actually a guy with autism who, who had this quote, but I think it's equally applicable. And he said, labels are for things like Coca-Cola and, you know, products. Labels are not for people. He's like, as soon as you say, I have autism, you're labeling me, and now you're putting on all sorts of things about what I can't do and what people expect of me. So I think that's what we have to remember with dementia too, right? It's a label that then kind of displays to people all these things you can't do, where in truth, that's not the case. It's a massive, massive umbrella that covers all range of capabilities and abilities that are layered over top the normal likes and dislikes and abilities and temperaments and hobbies and love and everything else that makes a person who they are. So don't design for dementia. Design to enable people to live the lives they want to live. That's, that's my spiel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elaine, and I'm not going to talk about technology, actually. Um, I did write down some notes because I'm from Thunder Bay, and I did fly here this morning, so it was a 4.30 wake-up for me. So um, I didn't time it either, so <laughs> like Brenda did, so hopefully I won't go over my five minutes. Um, but I wanted to say uh, we've been working um, for about four years now on uh, self-management uh, for people living with dementia, um, and we've learned a few things along the way. Um, We've learned that um, self-management really is about people, and it's about stories and personal experiences. And I think just um, you know, reiterating what Jen said as well, that it's about people. Um, and we really you know, want to emphasize that in the work that we've been doing. Um, see, and now I'm not following my notes, and I'm already on a tangent. OK, so I'm done. <laughs> done on the tangent, not done on my notes, sorry. Um, we, we've, been, uh, we've been working for the past two years with funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to develop a program for people living with dementia. Um, the most exciting thing about this is that we've actually been working with over 20 people living with dementia across the country um, to develop this program. Um, and the thing that I want to emphasize is anything that you develop develop, people with dementia need to be included from the very beginning. It's not enough for you to develop something and then to bring it to them and ask for their opinion. You need to involve them from the very beginning. The program that we've developed has actually been with uh, these 20 people living with dementia and they've told us what to include, what the content should be, how the content should be laid out, what things we need to consider. They've looked at the curriculum, they've told us about the learning activities and the way the information is presented and given us some wonderful, wonderful feedback. 
So we're really, really excited about that. We're just in the final um, phases of, of finishing this program. And there's eight weeks, and I'll tell you just briefly what those themes are in those eight weeks, and you can compare them with what's there on the, um, on the board and see if there's any similarities or differences. Um, the first is memory tips and strategies. Uh, the second is adapting to change, so problem solving and some of the changes that happen with dementia. Finding meaning and purpose, so having a positive outlook and having purpose in life. Communication, uh, communication strategies, but also finding my voice and being able to advocate for myself. Safety, independence, and decision making. Staying well. Uh, emotional health, so managing your emotions and resilience and managing stress and building and keeping connections. Um, the importance of connection and creating safe spaces. The other thing that we've been doing as we've been developing this program is we've been learning a lot about how we actually engage meaningfully, authentically, and in real relationships and real partnerships with people living with dementia. It's been really eye-opening for me, and I have to say I've worked with an amazing team of people, we call them personal advocates, people living with dementia, Brenda being one of them, um, researchers, Lisa being another one of them, um, and, uh, and practitioners, so the Alzheimer's Society of Ontario and BC and Saskatchewan, which has been wonderful. And I just, we have seven lessons, we have more than seven lessons, but I wanted to share seven quick kinds of lessons that we've learned that will hopefully help you. The biggest thing that we've learned is to slow down. We live and work in worlds that are very, very fast. We need to slow down if we want to engage meaningfully with people living with dementia, as well as with anybody. Relationships take time. Allow time for conversation and make sure people living with dementia are included from the very beginning. The second is stigma, and stigma often prevents people living with dementia to actually live well. So don't try and bubble wrap people. Let's, let's not be trying to take away decision making, but let's be trying to empower and enable people to live well. The use of technology can be challenging, and yet you've heard from Brenda and from B and many other people that many people, um, older people, people living with dementia are using technology. Building on their capabilities of what exists is really important. Um, interfaces need to be simple and uncluttered, as Darlene mentioned. Logins and passwords can be problems, so we need to avoid some of these things or think of different ways. Having two things going on on the screen at the same time can be very confusing um, and, and distracting. Simple is better, but simple is harder. Um, it's much harder because it requires us to give a lot more thought about the essence of what we're actually doing and take away some of the fluff. Flexibility um, is really, really, really important. Being able to have something that can change and adapt to the person, that the person can customize um, to meet their own needs is really important, and we've learned that. Different ways of conveying information, so not just through words and language, but using uh, visuals, using icons, using metaphors, using, vi using video vignettes, poetry, showing rather than telling. Ask, number six, I'm almost done, am I at my time? Ask is probably the most important, nothing can be worse than not asking. You, maybe you think it's a little bit silly, but take the time to stop and ask somebody living with dementia, what is this like for them? What do you think about this? How is this working for you? Um, and we don't do that very well. So taking the time to ask somebody. And lastly, knowing the person. We've talked about this already. It's not a label. Th these are people that we're talking about. Program for people, uh, not for dementia. Um, be in the moment with a person and respect his or her life experiences. It's really exciting to see uh, so many young people here today, and um, especially people maybe who have never been exposed to dementia before. And so I'm really hoping that uh, you can enter this with understanding that the personal experiences of people living with dementia um, are to be valued and to be understood, and that you'll take the time to ask and to listen. Thanks. Thank you all very much. Um, so we have about just over 30 minutes to some question and answer. Teresa will be circulating with a microphone if anyone has a question. And I'll pass this mic to our panelists to answer. You can address one of them or all of them. It's as you wish. Got one question there. Thanks a lot. Um, I have a question about people who are at very, very early stages. Um, what exists for them and are there any success stories that you know about 
where it was either reversed or stopped. So from our experience, what exists for them is what exists for the general public. And they go out and they find solutions that work for them. Usually they get, if they're older, they'll get their kids to help them or they'll get a caregiver practitioner who, you know, kind of has an idea of what usually works. And they just download it and adapt it as best they can as the dementia progresses. In terms of does the dementia get better? It depends on the type. So there are many, many types of dementia. Alzheimer's, no. At best, you can maintain, but it's usually a downward slide. But that said, how fast it goes down depends on so many factors. So uh, designing for dementia is a massive, massive challenge from the technology point of view because it's very dynamic. And your day-to-day -day performance will change. So you can do things in the morning that you might not be able to do in the afternoon. Or, you know, it, overall it'll go down, but in between you're kind of up and down. So it, it's very, very challenging. Um, yeah, I would, I would add to that that one of the um, participants who, um, in fact, you saw his hand on the screen, um, through that project, he joined a project in 2012 and he had one of the different sorts of dementia, which uh, was a mixture of vascular and Lewy body, if anybody knows what they are. Um, and one of the problems, main problems he'd had was depression because of he'd worked in the care industry. When he got diagnosed at the age of 60, he thought, well, my life's over, I can't do anything. And he'd been very depressed and withdrawn and not participating in social events. And he'd just started attending a day center where we, we met him and he was... In the, in the interview for the, the project we took along, he said he had previously used technology, but he'd lost all his confidence. He couldn't do anything. In fact, he didn't use any technology at all. And over 18 months, uh, we, we worked with him. Um, he wrote a blog for us about using it, and you can see it's at the Cobalt Project. But it basically... Um, uh, documents his journey of, of learning, first of all, to use an iPhone, which his wife went out and bought him when he joined the project. And so it was learning how to use apps and so on. Um, and then uh, we, we lent him a laptop because he wanted to try and use a, a, a bigger computer. And it's not all, not all happiness. You know, there's times when he can't do it and he feels unwell and he has setbacks. And it's very human. Um, and then he went on to actually give talks at some of the conferences we held. Um, and what I would normally do if I, if I had longer time was um, I have a great clip of him describing his experience because his words are much more powerful than anything I can say. And he ends up by saying, you know, the depression has lifted. Um, I've got my life back. And he says, I may only live a, a few more years, but I'm enjoying every day. And to me, that's what you want to achieve because he knew the, the damage in, the, in his brain wasn't going to get better having some autonomy and independence, being able to travel, feeling he was able to do things made all the difference. And it was almost sort of a, a random opportunity, but it, it's very uh, powerful because that was his experience of it. Okay, my question's for Dr. Estelle. Um, the games that you showed uh, on your PowerPoint, what was the purpose of them? What were they for? Uh, fun. Just to have fun, so they needed... Um, if you look at what technology has been developed or where it's focused, a lot of it has been about safety and security. And most of us uh, like a bit of fun in our lives. <laughs> it's what makes life worth living. Um, but, but a serious point was that after we did the first project, um, people came back to us and said, is there something people could do maybe independently? Is there a way that they could use a computer to play, to do things independently? Um, so, we, so we were aiming to solve the issue of how to enable people to do things by themselves without someone having to be there going, press this, now do that, and whatever, uh, which is the problem with a lot of things that are available now because they're not made for com uh, cognitive impairment. But the other thing is, it, 
I think I think you both made this point about about stigma and um, the low expectation. In all of the research we've done with those uh, uh, systems, the biggest finding has been the impact on, say, care staff who are just amazed when they see people um, doing these things independently. So the strategy I took in the end was if I went to a care home with, a, with the games, I would find one of the residents and, and sh get them to play one of the games and then ask them to introduce it to a member of staff so that they had the sort of power and control because you need to challenge those negative perceptions all the time. But yeah, at the end of the day, it was really for fun. Um, uh, but also the satisfaction and achievement and the laughter and, and also the sharing. They're good for intergenerational games too. And uh, there's one called Beat the Goalie, which nobody seems to be able to resist because you get a clap or a cheer or a big boo if you don't score. <laughs> so and is that because there aren't that many games available for people with dementia? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. No, not really at all. We started making those in 2004. Um, I'm not really sure there are many others unless someone else knows different. <laughs> it's not really, fun isn't a priority in dementia care, I think you'll find. <laughs> and I think that's a shame because what would, you know, if you look at what you do in a day, if you set aside your physical activities of daily life, most of it is talking, chatting, enjoying yourself, but we seem to give it a very low priority, you know, so. That was similar, we built a, art device for people with dementia is one of the projects we did. Um, this is for moderate to severe stages, so much later. So this was to be used with a friend, family, caregiver, what have you. And we pilot tested it with people with dementia, and it was wonderful. First of all, again, same experience. The things people were able to do with the device surprised their family, surprised other caregivers in the facility. But more than that, it gave them something to relate to and talk about that was not toileting, that was not the person's what they couldn't do. You know, They were drawing pictures and talking about what it was they were drawing and that would spark other conversations and memories. And it gave them a way to relate as people in the here and now. So we found that was a, a very powerful outcome of using digital visual media. And they could talk about pictures of places as well. Arlene's done <coughs> similar work and stuff like that. So again, you know, leisure activity that, that fosters communication and fosters expression of self. And this is really important, I think. Thank you. I think there's one more question here. Yeah, for the uh, last panelist, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Uh, I, you mentioned something about flexibility uh, for customization. I was just wondering if you had any examples of what that might be or yeah, any previous examples or ideas. So I don't design technology, so I can't give you any kind of example related to technology. I can give you the example, though, of this program that we've developed. So when I say program, let's just, this is uh, information skills-based, face-to-face, group come together kind of a program. So I should probably clarify that in a room full of people who do computer programming. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, um, what we've actually done um, with the program is recognizing that the people coming through the doors are all going to be different and are going to have different priorities, is we build the program in modules. Um, so the first week, you know, people come in the door, we have something that's standard, but the following three weeks, we have some foundational skills. The group themselves get to determine which comes first, and then the following four weeks after that, they get to determine what comes first. And we did that because we don't, um, if, if a group is coming through the doors and um, you know, finding meaning and purpose is really high on their priority list, but communication, you know, isn't. If we started with communication, they're automatically going to be talking and thinking about finding purpose and meaning in their life. And so we wanted to make things flexible in terms of being able to meet the needs of people where they were at. So I'm sorry I don't have a technology example for you, um, but, but I can, that's the example I have in terms of flexibility. The other thing that we've done um, is built the program on people's experiences. So to start, um, to start the knowledge, information sharing, learning, um, is building on people's ex life experiences. And I mean, that's a basic principle of adult education anywhere, is building on people's experiences and connecting that. 
Um, and the other thing we've done is, is used visuals a lot. Um, so, you know, while we have some written stuff throughout the curriculum, um, we'll have, you know, a little question mark where there's opportunity for discussion and a little book where people are reading or we're reading together out loud so that it's easy for people to find their places on the page, but also know exactly what we're doing both in terms of language as well as a visual icon. Uh, so my question is more about the games aspect because I'm really interested in the games aspect, f I guess for Arlene. So you mentioned that um, there just aren't that many games oriented towards people with dementia. Like, because I know that, uh, for example, on iPad, there are literally thousands of games. There's hundreds and hundreds coming out almost every day. And a lot of them I find are quite simplistic in nature. But, well, for me it's simple, but I guess for dementia it's not that simple. So what are some characteristics that would qualify it as a dementia-oriented game? Well, that's actually part of what the project that we're doing right now is. Um, t I totally agree, there's thousands of, of, uh, of apps. And I think the problem, I mean, I'm really pleased that the touch screens have become much more accessible. You know, they're in the high street, they're, and they've really raised... Um, expectations because when we started they were really expensive um, the problem is caregivers and care homes are getting them they're going to the iTunes store and they're faced with thousands of apps and how do they know what to choose so just one aspect that we've looked at is familiarity so if it's something you've heard of like um, uh, solitaire um, and even then if you look there's hundreds of apps and so then you look at them and if you're cognitively healthy um, I mean, you can choose between them on some fairly abstract things that appeal to you. Um, same with if you play Sudoku or, or something else. But the features that are probably important for people who have dementia will be different. So things like, I showed you quickly the bubble explode, and we, we thought that was a good candidate because you can change the size of the ball. So you can make it easier by having fewer available. Now that's not a familiar game, but actually we found people can pick it up and play it very simply because it's, it meets the sort of intuitive requirements. So you, you can learn the instructions very simply. Um, but other things we looked at were things like the speed in which things move. Because some games, again, they're made for people with intact cognitive function who, who've got good working memories, who can learn these things. And sometimes things happen too quickly or well, they move too quickly. So I didn't show you, but we made a coconut shy game, which you'll all be familiar with. And actually when you play it, the ball moves quite slowly through the air and you wait to see if it's gonna hit something. Um, and that would never be in a mainstream game, but it works really well for older people who maybe have some visual or, you know, uh, are just slightly s slower. And, and it's great fun as well, because sometimes it knocks down too, which you never see in a real one. Um, but um, speed is important, size, the clarity of fonts, can you change the font size on the game? So you know where you get the settings and you can go in, things like that. If there's background noise, uh, sound, that might, might be best off because if you're playing a game and, and when you've completed a bit, it makes a success sound, you know, a kitching or a whatever, woo. You wanna be able to hear that to know that you've done it right, but that could be drowned out by too much noise. Um, the other things about that Elaine was saying about not having too much clutter in anything, um, some things, like for instance, uh, we're looking at jigsaws, we're looking at painting. Um, if there's too much on the screen, if it's, if it's overwhelming. Uh, one game we, uh, we looked at had balls dropping, and then if they bounce up, they multiply, and it makes noise as well. It was driving us all completely mad. It was, it was terrible, because you couldn't like, control it. I don't know if anybody knows what it is, it's awful. Um, so it's about, being able to control those features so that j so that you can match it to the person. The thing I would really um, <laughs> sort of guard against, though, is making it infantile. There are many, many games for children, and that's what they look like. They look like games for children. And if you're a grown adult, you don't want a game that's made for children. And again, sometimes people have sent me apps and said, will you look at this, will this be suitable? And I'm going, well, if, if it was for a two-year-old, 
for sure. You know, a farm animal game, what, who makes which sound? But if you're a mature person, is, is that what you want? Maybe if you're sitting with your grandkids, for sure, but not for you. You want something that looks appropriate. So I think, um, but I would also say that some of the things are not as obvious as you might think. So we, as I said, we tried familiar games and solitaire is actually really difficult. Um, we found, we asked people and they said, oh, I know that, I played that. But even though we thought we'd found a very nice version, a lot of people found it hard. Not everybody, some people could grasp it. And I'll tell you for why, just for one thing, we were using iPads and because it's got a touch and a swipe, that's two different ways of interacting that you have to learn. And you have to remember which t time you do which. Oh, that's fine for us if you're you know, cognitively healthy, but if, if you've only got enough resource to learn one of those ways, you can't play that game. And, that, and you know, um, on the other hand, there's a game called Shuffleboard, which is very simple. You have like pins at the end and you just do one action and it moves up the board. That's really simple because you press it and you see what you've done. You don't have to learn lots of things. So it's very much about thinking what are the features that you can control and what you might have to accommodate. So like I said, vision and speed. Yeah, really intuitive interface. So if it's off screen, then it doesn't exist. You know, it has to be there. You can't have menus where they'll swipe and then more stuff will come because they won't know to swipe. If it, so touch. Yeah, pop-ups and and things that reconfigure themselves by themselves. That's not so great either, because then people are like, "What did I just do? And what is it doing?" And it's it can be intimidating, you know. So either it's in response to something you've done, and it's a clear, logical response to what you've done, or they have to physically, you know, move something around. So that's some other. Aspects. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if there's been any events where game developers can actually submit games for dementia patients. No. To be honest, I um, I presented at a conference in the summer. I was asked to go and do a session on ga digital games for older people. And to be honest, the work that we started in 2004 was still the only stuff I could find. <laughs> so, if anybody's looking for a space to get into, there is a big one out there. Um, just two comments. One, I worry a little bit about specifically saying creating games for dementia because of the stigma part of it. I think we'd have more success, any older, anything for older adults, if it's for the general population. Um, I think there should be a way that we can alert people to find these games, but that we avoid calling it a game for dementia. Yeah, and just I because I, people don't want, people don't want to, you know, accept even that they're getting older, let alone the stigma of dementia, yeah. And then the second um, comment or question I have is, you know, I think about games, and generally most games get harder as you accomplish something, you get harder as you accomplish something, you get harder. What I haven't seen is a, a mechanism, so yes, you could, um, customize font and speed and things like that and, and very few games, but theoretically that could be built in. But is there a way that you can analyze where they're having difficulty and then respond to that so you almost go back down levels as the person's dementia progresses? I, from what I know of the games and the work that I've done and what we're trying to do at the moment, um, that sort of thing, the only system I know that has anything like that is not a game system per se, it's more of a quiz system. Um, and it, it's something, it's, um, oh, I've got to ch challenge my memory to remember what it's called. And it's some memory device. Uh, he'll come to me in a sec. Um, their, what, how theirs works is it has a very simple, this might be something you want to bear in mind, um, a very simple sort of base, a level setting activity which I think it does every day, because you, you, the idea is you can use it every day, and so it, it adjusts things. So for instance, sometimes with quizzes, there might be four answers or... No, it's not Lumosity. It's, um, it was something that was developed specifically, again, for, for seniors with some in cognitive impairments. The name escapes me at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, Lumosity is probably the, the one 
that has sort of advanced the most in, in that way. But it's whether you're talking about games that are for cognitive training or enhancement. And again, that's the other thing. There's sort of divisions in the ones that are focused on trying to enhance cognitive function or cognitive maintenance and the ones that are for, for other purposes. Um, coming back to your point, though, I would just say, and I don't know if people want to bear this in mind, but the point you made about whether we're calling things for dementia or, or not, I was just at a meeting of two days ago, with, it was called a, a Youth Leaders on Dementia meeting, and this issue came up about should we be using this word, is it too stigmatizing? And the room was pretty split, because some people felt it was being reclaimed and, and it was actually now being neutralized sufficiently that it was not so stigmatizing, and other people felt that it was too much of a heavy label and that it already puts things out. So I'd be very interested in what some of the other people in the room think. I've struggled seriously with this question because how do you market your product if you don't say it's for dementia? Um, and you want to stay away from the infantile, you know, like the light sound touch I think you were referring to. It is for children, but you know what? It, I've had some success with late stage people because it was something to do. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you find that balance of marketing it because it is for dementia and giving it a name where people will say, oh, I can use this for my mom, my dad, my, my friend. Uh, so if you divorce the two, then how do we get the products out there to people who would like to use them? And I don't have an answer. Um, I am one of those living with it and hating the word okay. only because there's so many people in the general public who connect it with demented and immediately they start talking down on you not because they mean to but it just happens or the last question to the next person beside you you know um, so I Personally, this is the label I've made up for myself. And, and I'm wondering if this is a name you could label the games at. I say I live with a progressive memory deficit. And so if you say you have a game that's for those living with a progressive memory deficit, somehow that doesn't sound as bad as saying I'm buying something for people with dementia. I'm, and I'm just wondering if you can't just, um, yeah, have a category of games for people living with progressive memory deficit. If that would solve it, I, it's a thought. Thanks for those comments, B. And and I have to agree. I mean, this is probably a philosophical discussion around you know dementia and what it actually means. And and I agree with you. I think I've heard too many, particularly in healthcare, call people demented in referring to somebody living with dementia, which is extremely disrespectful, in my opinion. Um, and so I think that's a really big problem. And I think that's where some of that comes from. Absolutely. Um, some there's, there's a, you know, some different terms that are starting to emerge as people are, you know, considering, do we use this language or do we not? Um, Phil Caffrey, who's here from ASO can probably, probably, I, I know we've had this discussion about some of the different terms that have been used, but one of the things that we also do talk about is brain health. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's another way um, that you're not labeling somebody that necessarily has a diagnosis, right? But your, you know, brain health, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, certainly that's, you know, something else that's come up that people seem to accept. So, um, you know, just some thoughts. And, and to further that, I don't think we should just do a category for games. I think it should be a category on the app stores for all the devices, you know, we should work to create a new category for, and not just for cognitive loss, but for all sorts of other 
things that we think apps can help. I think that's one way as well of reducing the stigma that we keep talking about. Start developing and start pushing into the mainstream and utilizing things. And this will also help the whole idea of how, okay, there are things out there that might help, but how do I find them? You know, how do I connect with them? Well, if you label it, then you can search it, then you can find it, right? So, I mean, that that's, we've been talking a lot about games, but that's just scratching the surface of what is possible with technology that we're just not leveraging right now, so. No. Okay. No, I think the, I think the whole point is I don't think I'm just designing games specifically. We're already like siloing all these patients into different silos. I'm just wondering, just making the games accessible. I think that's the key thing. Like you could make a game. Like who knows? Like, there might be a patient who loves uh, like one of the shoot 'em up uh, RPG games. We don't know that. So the key thing is if you make a game accessible to these patients, maybe slow down the gameplay, uh, maybe make it zoom in a little bit better. Those things, like simple things like we, the accessibility, sorry, accessibility settings on a game, if you, change, if you add that little factor, maybe your game could be made into, could be played by a dementia patient. Well, I, I think the point that was made over here about making things for the general public, I must say the things that we made, and when we started, I would say they were all made in, in partnership with people who had cognitive impairment. They directed everything all, all along the way. Um, and I think you're right, because now there's so many more things available, but nobody even thinks about doing that. And we're not just talking about older people with cognitive impairment, there's lots of other groups, you know. And so if something, if, if people know about changing the settings, mm -hmm. I do if it's have, games you're making. Yeah, we had a bit of a cue here, thank you. Got one question there. Yeah, um, my question is, uh, like especially for uh, Toronto Rehab, um, whether there's research done for like playing games and particularly exercising certain part, like area of the cognition. And um, also like with my business, I find like we do actually use the children's software like for seniors because initially we thought we have to take out some of those features, but then we find it's not um, silly. Like it just in the real life when we give it to the seniors, they actually wanted to keep lots of the features in there. But I'm looking in more in the health like side, like whether games can actually promote the brain health, uh, that type of research too, um, yeah. It's a good question, and there have been studies done. I don't have the names off the top of my head, but if you contact me, I can help connect you or just do a search. So there are studies looking at what types of games promote what type of brain function and is it actually significant improvements and depending on what your cognitive diagnosis is, et cetera. And of course, all these things interplay and what works for one group or person doesn't for another, et cetera. Another bunch of research that's being done that's quite interesting is using games and computer use in general to try and detect dementia before a doctor actually could. So things like looking at clicking rate and things like that, you know, it starts to drop off the scale before you start exhibiting perhaps other symptoms. It's like what we heard this morning where, you know, he couldn't hold a job because there were these subtle communication problems that were starting to surface, but he didn't have a diagnosis at that point, even though that's what's going on. Well, how you interact with a computer, turns out that actually is one way you can sort of tell that something's up and something's going on and sort of just on the sort of topic that we're talking about these games and functions and people wanting stuff in one thing I challenge you all to do during the hackathon is like think of your like your favorite apps and the f your favorite things that you like doing with your device think about that and then think about how you could adapt that for someone who has a cognitive impairment, right? Because just like you, they want to do the same sort of things you do. It's so it's just like mm -hmm. making it so that they can actually do it. to identify these sorts of things. Oh, yes, uh, some sort of a logo to identify, something that people would recognize instantly, like the World Wildlife Fund has the panda 
kind of thing and you'd really that that's it that's where I need to go don't even need to have a name but I like brain health yeah. well I was going to say I mean the the I think the brain health movement um, is maybe one of the ways but again people have to know that that's not too cryptic to understand what that might be um, referring to um, and I, yeah and as Elaine said the, the debate about the the language is perhaps a, a philosophical one for, for another space. But I, I think as well, I mean, the, the point you're making about sort of cognitive enhancement, um, there was a review done uh, a few years ago which looked at all the studies that had used computer-supported um, interventions, not necessarily games, but exercises and so on. Um, the biggest problem was lack of generalizability. So whilst people could improve on the task they practiced on, there wasn't very good um, extrapolation to, end to other domains, and I think that's been quite a consistent thing because the, you know they're, they're very focused, but the sort of effort return rate perhaps wasn't as good as people would hope. But I think you also have to think about what is realistic. So the things I was showing you, there is still learning involved. There is there is new learning, and there is um, evidence of that being maintained. Um, but it's whether those things are explicit. In other words, you have to explicitly concentrate or whether it's implicit, so you learn it by doing it. Um, and those are very important when you're thinking about what, what you make and what it would look like and how much relies on uh, you know, contributing a lot of cognitive function because that might be compromised. And also whether you're maintaining the, the function just by doing the activity itself, whatever it is. Last quick response. I was just going to say in terms of a logo, thinking about the UK and what they're doing with their dementia-friendly communities movement where they have the forget-me-not, which is the Alzheimer's Society logo. And, you know, once um, organizations or businesses, you know, have had some training on understanding dementia and supporting people with dementia, they have a little logo that they can put in the window that says working to become dementia-friendly. And it's, you know, thinking about that logo and some consistency across whether we, you know, at a community level, at a, you know, technology level and stuff, making something that's really consistent that, you know, people then can know and automatically recognize. I think it's a great idea. All right. Thank you all very much. And I'd like to thank our panelists again for taking the time to share expertise.